I think the blockchain at the moment kind of isn't going in the right direction. It's a sum zero game at the end of the day. They don't tend to understand the, the technology. We've made quite a few bold um, predictions over the last couple of years, I'd say. You short Solana and you short Polkadot, you short FTT, you know, before anything is broken. I think that moonshot is coming, but it's not coming up front. Welcome to BitGet Show. I'm your host, Bugar Usi, and today we have Nick and Chris. And I have a question. Is crypto cheeky? It's, uh, yeah, very cheeky. Um, it's a name that actually that we kind of came up with way back in 2020. It's, uh, I guess, tongue in cheek to a point. Like, so you either love it or you hate it, like Marmite, if you know what Marmite <laughs> is, of course. But, like, do you ever want to be taken serious? Like, or how do you take. How do you get taken serious because you do a lot of analysis and talk about like a macro things and then you're like a cheeky crypto? Yeah, um, maybe Chris is the better one to ask because he's really dr the driving force behind the name, I think. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess perception to me is important, but I think I'd rather people focused on the results. So, you know, when we're talking about technical analysis, you know, making predictions, like to be measured really on the results of that and i think you know particularly this bear market you know we called the likes of ftx before it collapsed um before that we had called the the most recent low which was in june 2022 uh we called that in may matter of fact i sold my crypto and told everybody i was selling it in may and everybody told me that was going to be the worst decision like we made so i'd rather be measured that way um I think once people have started watching the channel and sort of digested some of the, you know, analytics and stuff that we talk about, they normally take it very seriously, which is quite cool. And you mentioned like about measuring the results, like how do we measure the result? It's always about the dollar number, Bitcoin number, what the number, what is the result? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different elements to that, right? There's lots of different KPIs that you could look at for measuring results, right? Obviously, we have... Whether or not you make a really bold prediction, such as you know the uh, the FTX crash, you know, and you short Solana and you short Polkadot, you short FTT, you know, before anything is broken, uh, those results are really quite obvious. They're really there to see and um, are not 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 something that's hidden. Um, and then there's kind of the results that you look at internally uh, as to whether or not you've got your user base growing and things like that. Um, and for us, I think it's a mixture of, of all of it, you know, through to the growth of all the different YouTube channels or the Discord and the Twitter accounts or X as it's now called, um, all the way through to whether you are accurate with your technical analysis and your predictions. And we've made quite a few bold um, predictions over the last couple of years, I'd say, you know, uh, the bear market low not being in June 2022 was one of them, as Chris mentioned, um, predicting out more bleeding in the market. Uh, in 2023, which we saw all the way through until June, I think, uh, again, 2023. And then most recently, you know, uh, all the way through to Bitcoin spot ETFs being a sell the news event, right? Those are really quite obvious uh, predictions uh, that are bold and kind of you get called out because it hasn't happened yet. And, uh, and I think for the most part, those are quite easy results to kind of measure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other things as well. We've talked about tokenization. We've talked about everything being on the blockchain, everything being tokenized. You now start to hear lights of BlackRock talking about that. Um, so, you know, I think we've made a lot of bold predictions and so far all but one has come to fruition, right? Yeah, I'd say so. But like in a market that's so speculative and like a single tweet or one, you know, even like a false information can change everything up and down like how do you make a prediction there's there's lots of really complicated ways to do it and then there is uh, my preferred method which is basically just track people um so there is a technical uh, analysis or a form of technical analysis called elliott wave theory and elliott wave theory is basically a herd mentality it just tracks people's behavior and based on those behaviors you develop certain uh, characteristics that will output a result and uh and if you understand all the rules, it is a complicated subject, but if you understand the rules, you can be predictive over where the market is going based on the behavior of the people participating in said market. And it doesn't work on all markets, as in projects with really low liquidity, that's going to be really hard 
to be very predictive over. But high liquidity markets like Bitcoin, it's very predictive. And because of that, you can make some pretty bold uh, claims, such as Bitcoin spot ETS being a sell the news event. Obviously, there's a lot of history that goes into that. Um, but also you have all of these other technical indicators or analysis methods that also kind of confirm that initial kind of speculation, if you will. In crypto industry, I think like all the opinion leaders and people in the market, usually I can easily divide them into like a two groups. One who are like truly believe in the technology and they're like advocates, not much on the like a currency side of the things, but more of a technology side of it. And then the traders and analytics and everyone who are more about like a short term currencies, ups and downs. And in between two of you, who is on the which side or you both are into currency side of it? So, so <laughs> I, I think I'm more fundamentals. He's more technical. Yeah. Um, so I will do a lot of um, project research. I will um, reach out to teams if I don't understand parts of the white paper and stuff like that. Um, you know, we like to build great relationships with some of the the project leaders as well, you know, and try to to build that up. And we've done that, I feel, successfully over the last few years. So, you know, you kind of get more in-depth information from from the project teams as well about some of the things that they're thinking about. And I think it just widens my kind of thoughts on on the market, the technology. Uh, and I like to share that with our community and just try to educate people on the actual underlying technology. Um, but you're more of the technical analysis. I think when you group that together, it's a really, really good dynamic. Yeah, I mean, obviously the technical analysis uh, allows you to pick and choose when you can enter and exit a market. And if you do that enough, then obviously you'll compound all those gains over a period of time. And then, you know, you kind of start off maybe on your riskier plays and then you end up in the more kind of what we would call blue chips like your, your bitcoins your ethereums and things like that by the time you've kind of amassed quite a wealth you know like many people come to crypto for making some money i don't know putting their money into the better potential returns and i think it's very important to get like an in and out on time but also at the same time we always preach that you have to invest in the projects you believe, support. And initial idea was all this tokenization should give the power back to the people instead of corporations. Where are we heading now? It's a good question. I, I, I kind of feel that in some ways not in the right direction, right? The, the likes of uh, BlackRock and, and various other you know big entities getting involved. We're starting to see more centralization with Bitcoin, particularly over the mining aspect of things. I think the top four um, mining companies, uh, I think BlackRock, uh, one of the biggest shareholders in, in all four of those. Um, you know, so I think the blockchain at the moment kind of isn't going in the right direction uh, from a centralized, decentralized aspect of things when, when you put the, the, the lens over it in that sense. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a counter argument that you need a, a level of centralization in order to be successful, right? Yeah, I mean, from that point of view, I mean, it's an argument I have uh, myself in my own head sometimes about, you know, Bitcoin centralization and and where the future of Bitcoin is potentially going, you know, in two, three, four decades from now, um, knowing the proof of work uh, consensus and things like that. In terms of um, like the, the cryptocurrency element to blockchain space, right, or the industry as a whole, yeah, I would say that we're potentially not going in the right direction with the more meme coin culture that keeps popping up, right? Um, the, the projects that don't really serve any real world use case. Uh, that, I think, is something that kind of shocked me, I guess, to a point where we just exploded almost out of nowhere um, and doesn't seem to want to be dying off anytime soon. Um, that, I think, is something that will eventually have to evolve in the same way the NFT market will have to evolve and um, to be what they should be or where I think them, where they think that they potentially should be going in the future, specifically with, um, with real world use cases, you know, what's actually going to be developing you know, the world further forward with this technology rather than just JPEGs in NFT form or um, meme coins that 
serve absolutely zero purpose uh, at all other than pump and dumps. So I think, yeah, the space is very young still. It's got a, a lot of learning and a lot of growth still in it, though. Like in a market where many come for get rich quick idea, and I think that was a narrative across the press all the time and all the city legends was about someone put $100 and woke up millionaire. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, reflection are the meme coins. And from a trading perspective, do you trade meme coins or no. do you recommend trading P? No, I don't trade meme coins. Um, so we're a team, right? So what that means is Chris obviously looks at all the fundamentals um, and I'll look at all the technical elements like uh, charting and stuff. We both have to agree in order to invest. So if it's a meme coin that has zero utility, it's not going to be getting a great rating from Chris. And I'll look at the charts and I'll be like, yeah, it could do really well. It could, it, yeah, you know, gambling kind of mentality. But if we don't agree, then it's not going to be invested upon. Ultimately, I think meme coins are a incredibly high risk, right? It's a some zero game at the end of the day, right? Where there's a winner, there's, there's also a, a loser. loser. So very it's few like people become... 0.1% <laughs> winner and... <laughs> I, think, I think it's very much like that. I think very yeah, few just... people do just put $100 into the market and do really, really well like the media of portrayed crypto to perhaps be, right? Um, for us, it's more of a long time horizon when it comes to to investing it's all about the, the fundamentals of the projects um you know couple that with you know do we think that its value is is there like what's the risk factors and i think risk is something that a lot of people overlook uh, particularly at the beginning um this is one of the reasons why we set up the community that we've set up um, so we can support people, understand, you know, the risk of investing. What are the risks? You know, you've got third party risk, which a lot of people have realized, right, with F everything that happened around FTX. But, you know, where is that third party risk? You know, um, do people really know when they first invest where those risks are? Um, you know, and I think immersing yourself in a community of people with, you know, a good range of uh, experience is so important. Um, so that's like one of the things that we kind of really focus on the risk factors when it comes to to investing um you know trying to support people understand those those risks and where they 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 lie um for yeah. an average like viewer or user even in a centralized exchange what would be like a three main red flags for you just not to do it on an exchange on an exchange any project that is listed because for me, like especially like centralized exchanges play a great role because mm. there's a particular due diligence process that happens and you obviously look into different aspects before listing a project while in DAOs, most probably it's not the same or in all the other places. But still, even if someone comes today and decides, okay, I'm the newbie, I want to invest on something, but I still want to do my own research, like... In every project, what would be like a three top red flags that you guys would tell, okay, we are not investing because one, two, three. Yeah, I mean, one of the things on top of the list for me would be team. Um, we don't tend to invest unless we know who the team is. Uh, I think that's really important to understand who the, the team is, what their experience is. Um, you know, there's so many different altcoins, right? Um, you know, do they have experience in, you know, what they're trying to to build? Not necessarily from a blockchain perspective, you know, for, for a CEO or, you know, other people in the team. Uh, obviously, you need to have that technical capability within your team, but do they have it? Um, I think, you know, for me, that's a, a real important thing to, to be looking at. A lot of projects, you know, you've got individuals in the teams that have worked on other projects. How did those projects perform? What were, you know, the issues there? You know, why did they move and and stuff like that, which is really interesting. You can't always necessarily get all of that information, but you know, sometimes I reach out and I'm just like, you know, tell me your story. You know, how did you you get to to here? So I can try to sort of get some sort of idea of, you know, what's 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 happened in the past and whether they're, you know, going to be able to handle potential issues let's say something does go wrong you know they're a bridge hack or something like that are they going to be able to you know keep the project alive and you know move forward and, and stuff like that i think that's really important um the underlying technology would be another again i think that's just really important i wouldn't invest unless i really understood the technology and i'm going to say it now a lot of people they don't have the time 
uh, the resources uh, to, to really go and, and do that and look into that. Um, and we do like project reviews, we do write-ups and stuff like that to support our community with, you know, looking at that aspect of things, you know, is it really going to, you know, do what it says on the tin, that aspect of things. And to a point, you're still taking people by the word that, you know, they've got that technology and, and they're able to, to roll that out. But I think the third one for, for me would would probably be the sector uh, as well, uh, the market that they're looking to to enter. You know, when I say that, you know, there's different types of blockchain uh, projects. Um, they're all looking to have different types of utility in the real world, for example. Um, where do they fit? What's the size of the market? Um, and, you know, what are they projecting? That sort of stuff. That's interesting. I, I, I want to like move a little bit to a different direction and go back, you know, that BlackRock uh, mentions, especially mm -hmm. in the beginning of this conversation, we had two, three times. And I think the last two or three years, crypto industry, every conference you go, every podcast you open, every talk, everyone was like super excited about ETFs. And many, many would relate that as soon as it's approved, it will be next bull run, it's going up and, you know, things going to be better, money will flow. Like, but we didn't see it happening. Why? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can take you through a little bit of what I've been talking about for the last couple of months, I guess. I'm a little bit bored of it at this point, though, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, so the, the Bitcoin spot ETF um, was, or, or applications, I guess, uh, the early part of, of uh, 2023, um, huge speculation, right? It was driving so much kind of FOMO into the, into the market by now. Otherwise, you know, you'll never see these prices again. You see these comments even still to this day. Um, but history tells us otherwise, right? We saw this with the CME when that went live uh, initially, right? It was a sell the news event, right? All the FOMO, all of the speculation up front, you have a date of when something goes live, the opposite will happen, right? The market will go in the opposite direction to what was occurring beforehand. You can then fast forward and you can take a look at the Coinbase IPO. What do we see? Well, we have a day of a Coinbase IPO. You see an exact point for speculation to build up and then sell off when it actually happens. And then, of course, we've got the futures ETFs as well, which is something else that happened where you can see all the speculation up front and then a sell the news event afterwards. And here we are again in 2024 with exactly the same scenario, right? All of the FOMO, all of the speculation up front, you know an exact date, the 10th of January 2024. So what happens? You see immense amount of selling pressure. And so the moves that we've seen uh, most recently is something I've been talking about for quite some time because it's been very much expected. Uh, it's not been necessarily expected widely across like, you know, crypto Twitter, for example. Um, you know, a lot of the speculation was as soon as it's approved, we're going to the moon. Uh, but I think a lot of people also just failed to understand what the Bitcoin spot ETF was, how it operated and how it works. Because I think that moonshot is coming, but it's not coming up front, right? It has to, you have to have, or have to at least respect the process that sits in the background to it. Uh, ultimately, the ETF is people buying shares of the Bitcoin that's owned by the ETF. And the ETF will grow bigger and it'll own more Bitcoin to create more shares for people to buy on, on the stock exchange and so forth. But for now, as it sits, you know, you have to wait until that Bitcoin is, is accrued by that ETF. And it's going to be a very slow process. Um, it will be a really powerful process. And I think it will put Bitcoin on the map in a whole new way that hasn't been seen before. But it's going to take some time. And so moving down uh, in terms of prices is expected here. And I think most recently, since we flew out here to Dubai, uh, we lost the 40K support area and we tumbled down to, I think, 38 something. Um, so I'm still expecting us to kind of bounce a little bit and then move down towards 30K Bitcoin before really the pain is felt. Uh, that's where most investors were speculating on the Bitcoin spot ETF and where most of them are accruing Bitcoin. And I think that's really where the fear will start to set in and you'll start to see immense amount of selling pressure. But at the same time as that selling pressure occurs, we'll probably likely see institutional buying as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think like uh, because of last two years of bear market and everyone was like buying and holding and waiting for that moonshot, especially like the retail buyers, not the institutional buyers. I think as soon as ETS was approved, we saw that like a... Uh, Bitcoin that was owned by institutions is kind of a changing hands and mm -hmm. the sales happening while retail users or retail buyers are still like a hopefully waiting for, I don't know, 100K and all this like a really, really big numbers that... That's exactly it. I mean, we um, we do a lot of on-chain analysis as well as just looking at the charts. And 
all the way through 2023, Bitcoin holders of 10,000 BTC or more, uh, they dropped down quite significantly. I think they're about 7 to 8% reduction in the number of wallets that had 10,000 Bitcoin in them. And the same thing could be said for wallets that had a minimum of 1,000 Bitcoin. They are also decreasing. So as price was pushing up, we already saw there was demand coming in from the retail side and it was being fulfilled by the larger, wealthier institutional level investor. So they were kind of setting on the way up to the, I think it was like 48K, so I mean, top down to um, so they're all setting on the way up whilst retail investors believe that you'll go into 100k and it's the same story just a different year you can also couple that with um you know if you look at the fed pivot um you know in the lead up to to a fed pivot you normally tend to see these sorts of moves to the upside particularly from a stocks perspective uh, again i think it's 100 percent accuracy when you you look over the on-chain data for that and obviously that is you know, a much bigger pool of data than you've got for, for crypto. And I'm of the belief that crypto is still correlated with the stock market. And, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to, to see that be the final crash before we see the, the bull run. Everything just looks like it's uh, ticking that direction. Even if you look at the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, who's been selling Meta stock, you know, for the last couple of months of 2023, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, others doing the same. You know, I was recently talking to some peers and we were discussing, are we in a crypto winter over? I don't know, bull run. And I love saying that it's kind of a crypto spring, like maybe winter is over, but like summer is not yet here. Mm. And you mentioned like there should be another crush, right? Before, like, wh wh why, why should we see that? Like maybe like a technical perspective, but also you mentioned that you do a lot of analysis on like a user behavior or yeah. buyer behavior. Yeah, that, that's exactly it, right. So if you track people's behaviors, you, you kind of see a lot of people in, I don't want to use the word disbelief because it'll probably get misused, but I will use it in the context of, of this explanation. A lot of people are in uh, the disbelief or the denial of what's just happened, right? We haven't gone to the moon. Bitcoin's bought ETFs have, have been approved yet. They're, it will happen. It's just a matter of time, right? I'll hold my Bitcoin. It's not until the price comes down to where they initially accumulated the Bitcoin do they start to kind of get a little bit of itchy feet, a little bit, and I can get out, it won't cost me anything, I can buy it cheaper. Whilst that is kind of like the retail behavior that you see, the emotional uh, element to it, the institutions are very much, um, or the larger whale investors, institutions, whatever they may be, um, those behaviors from the on-chain analytics point of view is very cold. It's very black and white. It's the, I'm going for liquidity, wherever the liquidity may be. Um, and what we've seen in 2023 has been fantastic growth for the price action, but it hasn't been um, sustained. It was not sustainable for Bitcoin to continue that under the current buying and selling pressures, right? So retail investors have been heavily accumulating, whereas larger institutional investors who have the ability to hodl a significant amount of Bitcoin have been selling. And so the question just simply becomes who's right and who's wrong on that argument. I'm of the belief that follow the money, right? You follow the money rather than just the emotional behaviors. So when you kind of analyze the behaviors that sit in the background to all of the price movements, you start to think, well, I'm more than likely going to believe that the larger institutional investors or the billionaires and the multimillionaires are probably going to be on the right side of the argument and not going to be on the wrong side of the argument. And so what we've seen so far is a lot of selling pressure, wallets with large amounts of Bitcoin decreasing. Chances are they're going to be wanting to buy. Uh, they want to be back into it, but at a cheaper price. Where is that cheaper price? Well, as I said, 30K is a really interesting point. It's a good area of support. But it's also where the majority of Bitcoin was accumulated. And should we go down to, to 30K, which I speculate we probably will, it'll take a little bit of time, but I do think we'll end up down there. That is probably where most of the Bitcoin is going to change hands between the return investor and the institutional investor. So, um, yeah, we can take a look into a lot of different things. Uh, we often do on the channel uh, and in the Discord and for the memberships and stuff like that. But for the, for the most part, I'm not seeing what I need to see from the on-chain analytics or from where the wealth is um, in the right place. Bitcoin is heavily distributed now between retail investors. There's like over a million wallets with just one Bitcoin in them or a minimum of one balance of one Bitcoin. Um, whereas in previous cycles, it's been about 700,000, you know, 600,000. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, be surprised if 
if we see a 30% sell-off uh, from that size wallet alone, taking us back down to 700,000 holders of a minimum of balance of one Bitcoin. And, but that problem spans all the way down the lower side as well. The, the really hard done by retail investor, the nine to five worker, they've invested in the belief that Bitcoin spot ETS were going to take them to 100K Bitcoin and they were going to double, triple, quadruple their money. Uh, they're going to be left with, you know, facing uh, an option of, do I sell? Do I put food on the table? Do I pay the mortgage or, or not? You know, um, like, do you think like more and more people will be prone to kind of a sell and kind of exit the game or convert it to the fiat selling selling or the focus will shift maybe towards like a big 10 or some other project that have a higher fold or see, growth see i i personally believe that you know we're going into quite a big recession um and people are not going to be able to keep you know a roof over their heads feed their their kids and and that's where I think we're we're heading, right? Um, for me, Fed pivot. Um, that's going to bring a lot of hardship to to people, even invested in in cryptocurrency. There's a lot of talk about, you know, the the middle class, you know, being wiped out. And you know, I am of that belief that this is probably the biggest transition in in our history, uh, maybe even history. You know, from a financial viewpoint, you know, for history. Um, so for for me, I think that yeah, you're gonna have to to see a, a sell off. I really do think that that won't just be alone in crypto. I think that'll be across you know stocks as well. I do think that um, most people or most of the retail investors will probably sell back into fiat. Um, whereas I we have seen larger investors moving into stables uh, more so than anything else. So yeah, I I, I expect. Um, but obviously we're heading into the recession, whether or not we move the goalposts on that as we had saw uh, or had seen back in uh, 2022 or late 2022, early 2023. I think the goalposts on that it argument kept moving. Changed the uh, <laughs> definition, didn't they? Yeah, changed the definition of it. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I, we see it, at least from the UK point of view, um, raising uh, interest rates, fixed term mortgages coming to an end. And then your mortgage is automatically doubled uh, pretty much overnight by the time that renewal comes in. Uh, a lot of people struggling. There's a downsizing issue. So you get a lot of uh, larger houses being empty um, and then a huge demand on the smaller housing front. Um, commercial property has been a problem for a while as well. Uh, so like outside of crypto, there's a lot of things that kind of are affecting crypto um, and the cryptocurrency market. So I expect retail investors, not all of them, like I say, I wouldn't be surprised if 30% of them succumb to that. Um, and But that could equate to a pretty significant amount of BTC across those wallets. It's about three... About 3 million Bitcoin, uh, I think, on our last calculated, that could basically just become available for sale. And since the price action is only really driven from two things, supply and demand, there's only really one argument to that. The Fed will pivot only at the worst possible moment, uh, as in they will drop their interest rates at the worst possible moment for investors. And yeah, we might see a pretty significant amount of selling pressure. But I do think that's going to be met by a, a huge amount of institutional um demand for, for btc and i think we're not going to drop too far but it's going to be enough to see the transfer of wealth happen you know for me like every day first thing and last thing i do is to check like uh, the market cap of the entire cryptocurrency to understand how we are doing today because no matter the price is going up and down i think that's the one true indicator understanding the supply and demand like are there more inflow of the money happening or outflow of the money is happening and we haven't seen market growing for a long time now like what could be a good trigger for that inflow of money for example during the pandemic that you know checks that came many government support came people went to casinos and came to crypto which was a good move and we had so many small retail investors people came to play people came to gamble and all the other things and there there were like several triggers similar to that and everyone was hoping that you know etfs would be another one where institutional money comes in but we haven't seen that actual money coming to the door yeah i mean uh, i think big um blackrock uh, uh on track to you know already be one of the biggest holders of, of bitcoin uh with what they're you know looking to to do uh, I think that will happen over time. So I think there will be this big inflow um, of capital. I've always kind of said that there's, you know, if you think about like big companies, you know, whether they're public or, or private, there's normally 
you know quite a lengthy sign off um period of time and they have to go through right to to be able to sign something like that off to to move into to say bitcoin as a as an asset um so I, I do think that that will happen a catalyst for it i i think that the catalyst is already there i think we've just got to see some of the uh events that we've talked about like the, the fed pivot i think you know once that's happened uh printer goes burr and and all of that um i think we will start to see that sort of traction build up quite quickly like i say uh, and as you've mentioned institutions will probably be buying it up cheaper um so there'll still be demand there um but just enough demand i kind of feel that you know it gets a, a lot of retail out um it's kind of my thoughts i think it's like a very pessimistic direction we are heading <laughs> now mm. because i'm like i putting things together First, we talked about how like a 30% of most probably retail wallets will, you know, be selling because a session is coming and people wouldn't have money. Then how institutions going to buy cheap because they still have money and BlackRock's fidelity is they cater to the handful of super rich and super influential people. Like, don't you think that it goes against everything that crypto blockchain technology was about, like giving the power back to people and making everyone not take the share yeah um i think we said that that earlier right um yeah i think we're not going in the right direction with it um but i guess it's you know where where is your your... only direction at this point or it's a good question i think at this point in time yes it probably is the only direction and i think um until we're in a more regulatory friendly environment uh, specifically in like the US, but even like Europe and the UK, it's, it's, there's regulations that are positive in certain areas and they're really negative in others. I think until we have proper global clarity, we're going to see exactly what we have seen so far. We're going to see a what was originally centralized turn decentralized becoming more centralized. I think we are going through that cycle at the moment where we have to centralize things a little bit more we have to see this kind of wild speculative meme coin culture kind of come and go. Uh, And once regulations are in because of the, a, the centralization and B the speculation on the market, once that's kind of fueled enough um, eyeballs from a regulatory point of view, and we actually get some decent clarity globally and on different jurisdictions, I don't think we can really truly go proper decentralized, which I do think is going to happen. The world does require full decentralization, in so many different ways it's just i don't think we're ready for it yet in this industry yeah it's almost like the regulations need to play like a big major role in you know what what's right and you know making sure that there's decentralization to a, to an extent and i guess there's different forms of decentralization i think that you've got to have a really solid privacy layer before you really get the mainstream adoption you know your bank accounts You know, people currently, if they're on the blockchain, would be able to see, you know, what you've been paying, how much you've got in your account. You you know, we can't really live in a world like that. Same with your medical records. Um, Just to give you some decent, you know, examples there. Um, So I think you need to have an element of privacy, uh, an element of decentralization. And I think the regulations really need to, to play like a big, big role in, you know, defining what that that looks like but i think it all boils down to why people are investing in cryptocurrency where's the passion and i'd say it's greed is it greed yeah you know um you know why do people invest in cryptocurrency you've got the people that believe in you know the decentralization aspect of things you've got the the people that are true believers maxis to you know to to the end um and then you've got people that are just speculating, looking to 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 make either fast money or make money on you know uh, a decent time horizon view. Um, ultimately, I think uh, a lot of it is is greed and and selfishness. Uh, you know, last year we had this like a Ripple case when it was approved and Ripple price was going up, and everyone was like very hopeful for a day or two. But mainly when you do look at the on-chain analysis, you see that people would sell other assets just to come buy Ripple and short it to do like that short-term gains. Mm. 
And what is the danger of this kind of a turbulent market and everything going up and down for the retail? I won't say like a traders, but retail investors who don't trade as often or doesn't have that kind of a knowledge. Yeah, so the number one priority to anyone who's investing in cryptocurrency is to have a good understanding of time, how much time you want to be in the market, right? Um, if you're coming in saying, look, I'm going to put in 100 dirham or whatever um, this week and I'm going to withdraw 200 dirham next week, well, you probably need to rethink how much time you need to be in the market, right? It's not going to be quick money in that kind of sense unless, of course, you're just gambling, in which case, just go to the casino, just choose red or black <laughs> and be done with it. Um, but that time is very important, right? There's lots of people to talk about cycle theory every four years, every five years, whatever it may be, right? And they're not wrong uh, with that. If you can time, you know, just approximately where the bear market should end and where a bull market should be, and you say, okay, I'll go and be in this market for five years, then, you know, you're going to actually not see so much of that turbulence. You're not going to see that volatility uh, dropping and picking up again, right? And you spoke about Ripple. Yeah, you can see this. And you also mentioned market cap, right? Total market cap. Total market cap, total two and total three, all very important uh, for taking a look, right? You have all of crypto, including Bitcoin, total two, everything excluding Bitcoin, and total three, everything excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum. And all you can see when you compare all those is money rolling out, one rolling into the other, right? And no new money is coming in. So at the moment, we're just going through that that's part of the cycle where money is just rolling around chasing gains. And we often talk about on our channel not to do that. It's not really good. It's not really good for your long term portfolio if you're just going to be chasing green all the time. And the reason for that is you might get one or two right, but then when you get it wrong, you get it wrong big and you lose everything you just gained by chasing, you know, for the last three months or so. So it's better to have better time horizon, as Chris was saying. And to focus on how much time you want to be in the market, have a good strategy. Strategy is very important for crypto, in my opinion. If you don't have a strategy, this space just is just pure gambling at that point. You need to know what you're doing, in my opinion. And how to not gamble? Like, what would be a good strategy? Maybe not to put 100 yeah. dirham and take two <laughs> in a day, but like a long-term strategy. And of course, I'm still talking about like retail users perspective. Yeah. People who are not day traders, full-time traders, they just want to, you know, hedge, not lose, still experience the market. If there's a one, two good opportunity, go for it, but not a short term. Yeah. So more of like a medium to longer term kind of investor as a retailer. The first thing to part of building your strategy needs to know what sectors to be investing in and what is your tolerance to risk, you know, and then do your due diligence and your research into the projects that you're looking to invest in, right? Um, and that's going to, if you first of all figure out, you know, what sectors you want to be investing in, whether that's going to be the blue chips, your metaverses, your DeFi sectors, whatever sector it is that you're really kind of passionate about, find out the projects that are building in those sectors, and then do the research to say, okay, well, what kind of risk do I want to put in to each of those sectors? Are we talking incredibly high risk where, you know, there's like a 2% success rate? Or are we talking I want to be like super successful, 98% success rate, right? And you need to understand those things if you want to avoid gambling. And you do that by understanding the projects, by doing the research on the projects and understanding yourself as well, because it's not something that someone's going to be able to answer for you. You have to know how much risk are you personally willing to to kind of put up there right because uh, th there are a lot of common sayings in this space you know only prepare to any risk uh, only invest what you're willing to lose or risk essentially right and, and risk management as chris says a lot is something that so many retail investors simply overlook what i would say as well just to to add to that is like every individual is different and we, because we always get people say what should i invest in or like you know are these good ones to to invest in well you know everybody's a different age and i think age also plays a role in the level of risk that you should consider taking on you know if you're really young then you've got more years if you you know put in you know what you can afford to lose um and it goes horribly wrong, which it can do. Do you have enough time to build that wealth back up that you've just lost in in crypto or whatever investment instrument that might be? Um, you know, how much you earn, how much disposable income you got. There's just so many things that you don't know when somebody asks you that question. Um, and I think they're they're all going to play a part in you know 
what what sectors you might invest in, what your time horizon is, uh, how much money you're going to deploy in the market, and and so on. I think there's just an awful lot to consider that people perhaps don't consider. Um, you know, like the older I get, the the less risk I want to take. Um, you know, in my inv investment journey. Um, you know, you would have seen me all over meme coins a few years ago. <laughs> now I go nowhere near them. Um, you know, and I think, you know, there's a, an element of growth to my investing off the, the back of growing older as well. And like when you're talking about these investments and like, you know, playing around meme coins and so on, like the common, uh, I think, consensus is that the moment bitcoins goes up and then everything comes along. And it goes the other way around. When it goes down, everything comes because also like when people make some money in Bitcoin, they want to, you know, cash out and go play with higher risk instruments mm -hmm. and like up to meme coins. And on the other journey, they just try to put things in the Bitcoin because obviously for 10 years, it was the at least steadily growing asset out there. Like in current market situation, like how do we see the dynamic? Is it like going from the Bitcoin down to the, projects or from the other projects to the consolidation towards bitcoin in the portfolios so i think you you do see these cycles of people you know rolling out of bitcoin into ethereum into altcoins and i think that i continue um uh, particularly through this sort of bull market that we're going to head into um whether that changes going into the next one after that i, I think it probably would um as you get more adoption i think by the time what we're talking 2030 i think it's around that time i think by it by then i think you're going to have a more mature um i want to say audience probably not the right terminology but audience for for blockchain technology and, and crypto by that point i would expect uh based on um project plans for the bank of england and and stuff around the cbdc's and the implementation of those I think by that point, you'll have your privacy layers in, in place. Um, you're going to have most people on the blockchain or at least starting to, to be on the blockchain. At that point, I think it changes. I think like, uh, throughout the talk, we had mentioned several times the importance of like projects and the teams. And uh, I think like one of the biggest problems I came across was that you'd always have this like a really nice team. They have like uh, some product out there, but they would rush to kind of a, even not like a cash out, but like a issue tokens and try to make some money. And at some point, like they run out of the money, even though everything kind of was going right, it stops getting right. And people mm. just like, even the market condition, right? Sell and go. And recently I was reading that almost 24,000 coins that was like coin projects were out there like more than 70 percent or 80 percent died out yeah uh, i think it's a real problem right and again just goes to show you the importance of research in that team um you can research a team and you know i've done this and and projects still fail right um you know there's no guarantee um that just because they've got a great team and on paper they look really good at you know what they're looking to do doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, success of the the project this time right you know we all know how how many uh entrepreneurs have set up multiple businesses that have failed before they got that one that did really well uh, and i think it happens the other way as well how many entrepreneurs have set up businesses after they were ultra successful and all of those have failed as well um so there's no guarantee but i think you you can gauge an awful lot um from one looking at the the team on paper two what are they like in in real life not just on paper like do you get a chance to talk to them do you get a chance to see an ama with with the team how do they speak what are the surroundings like you know where you know we've we've watched a, an ama for a project that we were really quite you know passionate about and uh, invested in and um we watched this ama and the lights wouldn't even stay on and we were just like all right that's that's a bit concerning let's ask a few questions of you know a few more uh you know digs at, you know into to where they are what, what they're doing and you know what we found was horrifying so we exited and probably one of the best decisions that we did um but those things i think are really important you know um yeah you're not going to guarantee success from from just you know doing that research it doesn't guarantee that you know, go on to do really well um but i do think that you you're confirming 
your thoughts if you're really bullish on a project um if it all looks really really good and you believe that in that sector they can thrive and you know it's a a sector that's you know got a good market um and they can get a good market share um then i think you know without that research um you wouldn't be as successful as somebody that does that research if that makes sense you know i come from like a vc background and the logic of vc is that you'll invest you know to hundreds of projects and just you are looking for that one moonshot mm-hmm. to compensate everything else uh, and it it really makes very much sense from the institutional perspective while it comes to the retail users if they decide to do the same is you know 10 or 100 like uh, projects that are not top 10 we will consider it like super risky and I think like there should be like a different strategies as you mentioned like it's not only about like risk appetite but also like how much capital you have and what's your like long-term goal Mm -hmm. or even if you don't like necessarily want to lose all the money like how long you can survive without that money and also is this like a new instruments investment instruments that are now based on the stable coins where you can you know earn interest on them and all the other possibilities do you think like these new kind of tools and instruments introduced will make the place more stable for like a very small investors who come in as a like a retail base or you still think that the main motivation will be that 10x 100x yeah that's definitely the main motivation from the retail side right they aren't overly too fussed about holding stable coins um, and getting a three percent yield for example right um, they'll do that from time to time, but their main motivation is to find 100x. I can tell you that categorically with the comments <laughs> that we see, that that is the motivation. Yeah, it's it's 100x. And I think, you know, we've been through research very fortunate. I want to use the word fortunate because you can do your research and still not, you know, be successful in, in the space. As I've mentioned, it doesn't guarantee success. But, you know, we, we picked out uh, Polygon Matic, which was Matic at the time. Uh, I think we got into that about one and a half cent. Um, so, you know, a lot of people would probably consider that a blue chip now, right? Like for for a layer two. But back then it was not considered a blue chip. Um, and you can find these gems, um, but you have to spend that time to to do the research. You can't follow anybody blindly in this space because, you know, that would just be a disaster because there's so many bad influence influence influencers whatever terminology you wish to use out key there. opinion leadership <laughs> yeah i think that's the one for sure um so i think there will be in the future though two types of investors in i want to say blockchain the type that nick was talking about but then there will be the user type as well and what i mean by this is the people that are using the blockchain technology um, who don't realize that they're actually investing in the technology um, I think that they're going to be the the key for you know retail and you know your, your big in, um, institutions um, to to make good gains because we are here super early, right? We're only recently seeing you know wallets that you don't need to you know put a huge um, you know, number of digits into uh, that you don't need um, you know all the key phrases and, and stuff like that so we're starting to see more user-friendly solutions uh, come to the market and for me that's a real good positive sign that we're heading in the right direction for from an adoption point of view um, so yeah, I'd, I'd add those those users of blockchain technology in there as well because I think that's going to become a very dominated area if that makes sense compared to people that are just speculating in the background. Yeah, I also believe that you know uh, technology and the currency markets kind of a, should be a little bit separate from each other the way we perceive it because. Like technology is brilliant, and still you know PayPal can come and introduce their own coin. Or there could be like a real world assets that we always talk about, which not necessarily increase the currency market cap. It has, mm. it is just the actual assets that will be transactional or like uh, to confirm the deed, even though I'm sure we will all be considering it within the greater family, but yeah. which actually wouldn't happen. And also, in my opinion, like a CBDCs, right? They're tools, but like they don't much contribute to the whole idea because. Before government used to print money, 
then it became like a digital money on our credit cards and bank accounts and now CBDCs, you can only hold like, I don't know, 200 pounds of them. Mm. Yeah, CBDCs are um, <clears throat> an interesting technology. <laughs> Splits opinions, right? It's, uh, a lot of people are will, will say that they are the pure evil, right? You definitely don't want to be, you know, it's not what crypto is about. We don't want CBDCs. Um, I'm of the opinion that all technology is neutral. It's the people who are utilizing it, right? So... Uh, we have seen the digital euro campaign, right? Um, and the digital pound campaign, the sterling. Uh, they have two very different approaches, two different governments, right? Um, or elected individuals, if you want to kind of do it that way. Um, you've got Europe, who are basically going to say it's illegal to do a transaction that in cash if it's more than a thousand pounds or a thousand euros, right? Um, and the UK, on the other hand, are saying it's great that we're going to have a CBDC, digital pound, but we don't want you to hold more than 20,000 pounds of it. So you've got one side of uh, Europe basically saying, look, you're going to use it for everything. Anything under a th over a thousand euros, you know, is, is going to be uh, illegal if you don't use a CBDC. And then on the British side, it's uh, we don't really want you using it. <laughs> so I think we need more, as I said earlier, like global regulatory clarity on on everything, including CBDCs, because every jurisdiction is going to have a very different approach to a CBDC. Some's going to be positive, and some's going to be really negative. Um, and to kind of paint all CBDCs the same way, I think is is not right either. I was going to say as well, we didn't uh, elect the Prime Minister no, of didn't. the UK. No. Uh, so you got there <laughs> on a technicality, but um, yeah, yeah I, I agree with I agree with that to to a point. I think that it's going to be very interesting. I think one of the things that I've been talking about a lot is that I believe that regulators around the world are going to get it wrong a few times before they get it right. Um, and I'm okay with that personally. Uh, I think it's just the evolution of what we've got to go through with new technology. Um, but it's definitely going to be a thrilling ride. I think the unfortunate part about this, you know, legislators getting it wrong is that we saw like, even before all the FTX and crypto, like a Facebook and Cambridge Analytica case, after that, you know, everyone introduced different laws, GDPR came and I think it was a fail because today all the websites you go, they're half blocked and there's like, oh, I accept. We don't know even what we are accepting. Mainly people don't know what they're accepting. Mm -hmm. And it became just another formality without actual understanding what am I consenting to and what will happen if I don't consent to, I'm not able to use the product and nothing much change. Now we are consenting and our data is going somewhere there out there. And similarly, I think it happens every time the legislators get things wrong or get things late, end user is suffering and there are so much speculations happening. And I think legislators need to be smarter or hire smart people to advise them. And every time I watch any, you know, Congress deposition, you listen to questions, you understand that these people don't understand how technology works. And yeah, I think it's a real big problem at the moment. Um, they don't tend to understand the the technology. I think the UK have, have got a lot wrong recently as well. Um, marketing aspect of uh, rules have recently changed. And, you know, we've seen uh, banks in the UK, uh, you know, put in limits or, you know, stop you from, you know, onboarding in, into cryptocurrency. I was recently debanked by Santander in the UK. Uh, given 28 days to With remove my with. assets and and so on otherwise the bank would have froze those and um you know that was just because i had invested in uh cryptocurrency back in 2020 uh onboarded from santander to to coinbase uh, and the irony is that I was purchasing xrp and santander are actually partnered with ripple so um yeah it's really you know interesting um dynamic in the uk at the moment and i think they've got a lot wrong you know from the government aspect of things they're talking about crypto hub but if you're an individual in the uk you can't onboard you know freely to to crypto um platforms or exchanges um and you know they clearly don't like you uh you know investing in cryptocurrency so i think they've they've got to align better as well um from traditional banking uh, and, um, you know, the regulators and, and the government, I don't think they're anywhere near where they need to be just yet. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I've really got much more to say to that. I'd completely echo uh, what Chris is saying. Obviously, you know, the regulatory clarity is very much needed because uh, it, it, it affects so many different areas of an individual's life, um, everything from banking all the way through to, to making a purchase because, you know, in a world of CBDCs, could be programmed that you're not allowed to spend at that particular branch because you've had your allotment. Uh, you've had your fill uh, of gas this this month. You're not allowed anymore, and so forth. So, like the technology in itself, I think it's neutral, um, but we aren't seeing the right moves from uh, from from the government. So, well, I think the the key is make sure the people you're electing, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, one do what they say they're going to do, uh, until it's what you want in life, right? <laughs> I think like uh, like a. Uh, the way we interact with technology is also like needs to change and you know we need to self-educate because recently i was reading this you know ethical question and I said like would it be ethical for a self-driving car to lock it and bring the criminal driver mm -hmm. to the police station right mm. and the same thing is like sh because at the in the beginning of the journey narrative was that my assets, my keys, I want to do something. And then you have CBDC and like if you are still blocked and if it's not your asset, like then why all these like a uh, circus around the entire thing. But I think another important point when we talk about legislation and the industry is that average age of legisl legislator is pretty old. And also, even though we talk about young people technology, when we look at the wealth of the world, it's still with the boomers and mm. people who are above 40 and average age is around 70 globally. It means there's another 30 years that these people are around, they won't die, they won't pass their homes and access to the generation below. Like, how can we bring these people to Web3? Because I think we kind of... A, mountain doesn't go to Muhammad, Muhammad should go to the mountain. Mm. And without, do you believe that we can still achieve that growth and everything without the old generation or we should A hundred percent, I think it can, but I think it's all about simplifying things. And I mentioned earlier that starting to see a lot more simple like setups of, of wallets. I think that's just one step in stone, but I think that it's a step in stone in the right direction. I think the simpler that you can make things, the better. I think you've even got the likes of Starbucks that are utilizing uh, blockchain technology for like loyalty schemes and stuff like that, which I think is going to be like as a sector, loyalty schemes, I think are going to, you know, do very, very well. Um, you know, the front end user doesn't realize that that's on the blockchain right and the benefit of doing it on the blockchain is you can be more specific with you know how you tailor your offers to your customers i mean like you couldn't do that with the current systems that we've got in place that m the vast majority of loyalty schemes are, are based on so adding blockchain in doesn't necessarily mean that the front end user really even needs to touch the blockchain aspect of things and the crypto aspect of things for it to be successful and i think that's going to be the the route that we saw go down um mainly so i'll answer the questions maybe slightly differently um i don't think we're going to get them on board until the technology solves a problem for them right so as you say they've really got the vast amounts of the wealth right they're not filtering that wealth down. and power wealth and power right so they look at this technology and it doesn't serve them it doesn't help them it doesn't benefit them in any way and until it does i don't think things will change they'll either die out or we'll actually finally have a project that will cater to a need of the wealth and, uh, and power um out there in the world and until that happens it's, it's basically going to be you have to wait for them to die out uh, which sounds absolutely really cruel and horrible but you know um you, you need to either see them unfortunately dying out and passing on to people who grew up with uh, with technology and as you say usability is definitely one element to that mm -hmm. because the technology is not necessarily easy and user friendly for that generation who didn't grow up with it um see yeah. i'm very much of the opinion everything's going to be tokenized so stocks will be tokenized you know where is their wealth it'll be tokenized it'll be on the blockchain so i think that we will get there uh, i don't think it's gonna be overnight obviously um but yeah i i think that we're well on track to to achieve it uh i don't think they necessarily have to pass away like over time uh for for us to see that happen because i do believe everything will be tokenized i guess it's just the time frame the time horizon for that transition to happen i guess would, would <laughs> be like where, which one of us is cruel, right i don't know like, <laughs> you know in the beginning of the conversation i was like 
thinking like we are very pessimistic. And I, mm. I don't think we are pessimistic in terms of this conversation today. But I think we are pessimistic that it's not happening fast enough. And that's what brings the pessimism. And overall, we all live in a world where tokenization and the technology is here and it's here to stay. And we should just, I think, embrace it and look at the human behavior and make short-term yeah. gains <laughs> while, you know, waiting to make the waiting process fun. Thank you for the show today. And I was having Nick and Chris with me doing a cheeky crypto talk. And I was your host, Bugarusi. 